Hi everyone, welcome to this virtual classroom where you don't have to social distance or wear a mask. I'm Gary Palouse Overdend. I work at Phillips Theological Seminary in Tulsa, where I am currently the Executive Director for the Center for Religion and Public Life. And this is the first of five sessions I'm going to be leading on a course we've entitled Regenerating the Spirit of Democracy. And I'm going to get right into it. This is a longer presentation this first time than I'll make in other times. Uh, in the other four sessions, there will be a uh, interview I have done with an expert who will help us understand some of the issues we're facing. And uh, for today, though, uh, this uh, lecture is trying to give a framework uh, for understanding. So. Let's go ahead and start. Regenerating the spirit of democracy. Um, and we're gonna start with uh, a, a few lines from Walt Whitman, uh, who wrote a book called Democratic Vistas. Um, and read along with me if you would. Democracy alone is the old yet ever modern dream of earth, uh, not that half only individualism, which isolates. There's another half, which is adhesiveness or love that fuses, ties and aggregates, making the uh, race comrades and fraternizing all. Both are to be vitalized by religion, breathing into the proud material tissues, the breath of life. For I say at the core of democracy, finally, is the religious element. All the religions old and new are there. Nor may the scheme step forth, clothed in resplendent beauty and command, till these, bearing the best, the latest fruit, the spiritual, shall fully appear. And I chose that because the theme of the intertwining, the braiding of democracy, religion, spirituality, and life are all in Whitman's quote. A few words about you all. Um, first, uh, I guess this one's about me. This is the largest learning group I've participated in as of uh, Sunday afternoon when I'm recording this. Uh, our number is slightly over 140, um, and we're, we're really, really pleased about that. Um, from what I can tell, uh, you are from uh, many points in the United States, uh, including Alaska. Uh, there are a uh, uh, number of you who are laity, uh, a number who are clergy. Um, I don't know much about the uh, religion or non-religion or the age of the participants, except for the 50 or so I do know personally. Um, uh, I know from your uh, email signatures that there are something like... Uh, uh, a handful or so of, of medical doctors and more than a handful of PhDs uh, and uh, doctorates of ministry. Um, and then very importantly, um, there may well be content experts amongst us in particular areas of knowledge that exceed mine. So please don't be shy. Uh, email me, speak up in conversations we have and the like. If you have something to contribute, uh, to our learning, please do so. Um, we're doing difficult work, and I want to underline that, because we're trying to combine history and the social sciences and religious studies, um, while at the same time we're identifying and playing with and sometimes being shaped by um, uh, and shaping our own personal stakes on a set of issues um, that have tested this nation from its conception and forward, uh, and is uh, are, are apparently not going anywhere soon. So, why am I offering this class? Um, number of reasons. I was raised to love God and country, and not necessarily in that order all the time. Uh, that I'll unpack that some later. Um, between the time I was eight and fourteen. I could begin to see that my naive picture of growing up in a white suburban middle class home, first generation going off to college, um, 
that that naive picture was being disrupted, but I didn't have the language really uh, during those years to understand what that disruption meant. Um, there was, it took me until a course in college uh, I took as a religion major at a small school in Wisconsin um, to begin to gain some of the language to help me understand what was going on in this country in the 60s and early 70s. Um, and it was the, uh, this course in the prophets uh, in Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Micah, Hosea, and the like, um, where I learned that prophets are very often uh, truth tellers and forth tellers as in um, if we continue in this path, uh, here's what the consequences are going to be. And the path that they named was usually a path where the people had taken to being unjust with one another uh, and, uh, and working against God uh, who was measuring the justice in society by how the most vulnerable members of society are treated. Then when I went off to seminary, first in Washington, D.C., I got to participate in a semester-long project learning how people of faith uh, were working around Capitol Hill, uh, some of them clergy, most of them laity, trying to work out their faith in public life um, and not just to keep it private. And I saw amazing ways in which the, the church, as uh, Christian churches, uh, my own United Methodist Church as one, um, were involved in, in tremendous ways uh, trying to influence the values uh, of the nation at that point. Um, I've had an abiding interest uh, throughout my adult life in the nature of community, the communities I've led, uh, communities I've been part of, uh, but also the limits of community, especially the limits of diversity and disagreement and what we do with those, as well as the potentialities of community uh, which are all um, not defined, uh, meaning that uh, 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 we don't, there's no absolute limit that we can't have this diverse a group and not more of them, uh, hard as that is to accomplish. Um, a passion I've had throughout my life is that, uh, especially in my adult life, especially during the you now 30 years I've been in seminary education, um, I want Christians to have something intelligent to say um, and to act motivated by love and justice in public. Um, and last on, uh, on this slide is, is we're at a time of reckoning uh, in this nation. I think it's also a time of reckoning for those of us who are religious um, because uh, for Christians, uh, a lot, while well, I've said I want to be involved in those who are uh, with those who are uh, trying to help the church have something intelligent and, and, and intelligent to say and, 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 and just to act with. Um, I've seen too much of my, uh, those who use the same name I do as Christian, um, uh, putting forth something that is ignorant, motivated by fear, hatred, bigotry. Um, and sometimes claiming that faith is only a private matter. Um, uh, Christians have been the dominant group in offering the nation meaningful ways to understand itself from a faith perspective. Um, we are now a much more multicultural nation um, uh, over the last 35, uh, actually the last um, uh, 50 years now. Uh, than we ever had been in the past, and it's time for other faith groups also to be heard from. That's part of the time of reckoning for us as Christians. All right, so now I'm going to give you my framework uh, for how I understand what basically is going on in the nation, and, and I'll unpack this framework over the next five weeks. I'm going to say a few words here. Um, and probably focusing most on what I say about the Christian right. So here's my framework, and these are a series of statements connected by plus signs until we get to the equal sign at the end. The highly conflicted status of equality in America's heart and spirit, plus greed, 
as evidenced by the, the search for uh, cheap land and cheap labor, and racism that all led to the Civil War and that are the ingredients that uh, make up uh, the doctrine of manifest destiny for white people pushing from East Coast through West Coast and dominating the land. Plus, the last 40 years of the Christian right being involved in uh, national politics. I'm going to speak about that and what I mean by the Christian right and don't mean by it in just a moment. Plus, the coming of a no racial majority nation, that's by 2044, uh, this nation will be made up of all of us being minorities, ethnically and racially. Um, it was just a different place from where uh, white people have been since the founding of the nation per se. Plus, worldwide conflicts over democracy and diversity. Uh, this isn't just an American phenomenon by any stretch of the imagination. There are some people who have said that we're at war with our own God-created diversity, um, and I think that is correct. And all that together equals a disruptive era of both great peril and great possibility. And we're going to be talking about, like I said a moment ago, uh, over the, uh, this uh, uh, following four sessions, we're going to unpack uh, a fair amount of this. A couple of things I want to underline here. The value of liberty for some and equality for everyone has always been in tension and conflict in this country. Let me restate the, say that again. The values of liberty for some and equality for everyone have always been in tension and conflict in the U.S. Um, I'm going to underline that I like uh, in several ways, uh, the, somewhat this week, but also over the next several weeks. When I talk about the Christian right, I am not talking about all fundamentalists, all evangelicals, um, uh, all Pentecostals, all charismatics. That's not what the Christian right is. The Christian right is a religio-political movement uh, comprised of a uh, host or three of organizations uh, that have especially ones have risen up over the last 40 years, though some of them go back uh, older than that. Um, I'm talking about organizations, some of these you'll be familiar with, some of these you might not know, uh, like the Moral Majority in the 80s, the Christian Coalition in the 90s, the Eagle Forum, uh, from uh, ERA uh, days until this day, the Christian Broadcasting Network, Focus on the Family, the American Family Council, the Institute for Religion and Democracy, Liberty University and Regent University, the Congressional Prayer Foundation, the Homeschooling Movement and Patrick Henry College, which has put out curriculum for the homeschooling movement and through the college has tried to propel persons who have been raised in the homeschooling movement in a particular understanding of the role of the federal government, especially in courts, and have placed their graduates out of that college in a variety of places around Capitol Hill and in various uh, conservative think tanks. Um, and dozens of evangelical, Pentecostal, and charismatic megachurch pastors. Uh, this, the Christian uh, the right has been embraced as a voting bloc, uh, starting with President Reagan, uh, and then President George W. Bush, and maybe especially by President Donald Trump. As, they, uh, as the Christian right has moved along in the last 40 years, or especially over the last decade, we've seen a tremendous rise in those whose voices are advocating that this is a Christian nation, uh, something called Christian nationalism, um, in some of its most extreme forms, uh, uh, where uh, no one other than Christians really ought to be in this country at all. I think it's that kind of Christianity uh, that has helped push the country towards um, uh, polarization and dehumanization as, uh, as we've all been divided up into the children of light and the children of darkness and in politics as well as in our faith communities 
Um, uh, we don't have opponents, we just have enemies. So, um, uh, last thing I want to say, there's a, there's a very fine book um, uh, with a lot of these uh, points in it that I make in this particular uh, slide um, by Heather Cox Richardson, um, and it's called How the South Won the Civil War. Um, and as she talks about how white supremacy and land grabbing and colonial extraction mindset, um, the conquest narr narrative from the Bible, um, pushing off against the French and then moving into the wilderness and uh, the extermination and removal of indigenous people and looking for cheap labor like an indentured servant, slaves, sharecroppers, immigrants. Um, again, the value of liberty for some and equality for all has always been a conflict. So, um, how do you understand this? How do, how, do, how do I come to understand these things? I'm going to give you uh, a couple of perspectives. This first being some words and, and word phrases that are, I think, really important for us to get at this. And then secondly, I'm going to talk uh, about um, how I look at uh, democracy as a spiritual practice. So the three phrases are um, uh, to uh, regenerative agriculture, uh, culture, religion, spirituality, and then the relationship between politics and religion. Um, I do think democracy is in trouble. I do think Christian religion is implicated in the trouble our democracy has. Um, and I am looking for hope and trying to imagine a way to move forward. And these phrases uh, uh, are meaningful to me in helping to frame what's going on and also perhaps frame some ways forward. Why regenerate? Um, it's an analogy, it's a, a, the regenerative or, or to regenerate democracy, regenerative um, agriculture. is it, it is a phrase associated with agriculture these days. Um, there's a, a story of a farmer that my wife and I ran into a few years ago now. Um, this, we ran into the story. Um, we actually buy meat from this guy. Um, so, uh, he had a profitable farm in Georgia. Uh, he had, his family had owned the farm since the 1850s. He said his dad did what farmers of his generation did, which is to buy um, whole hog, no pun intended, maybe so, um, into uh, industrial agriculture and monoculture. monoculture. Uh, so putting more and more fertilizer in the fields, growing uh, one kind of crop over and over in that field, uh, and, and um, became a, a very profitable farm. Um, well, this generation farmer, um, took over, when he took over from his dad, did things the same way, industrial agriculture, monoculture, but started testing each year the health of his soil. Now, the health of soil is, is determined by, uh, largely by uh, how much life is in that soil. You know, a, a teaspoon of really healthy soil has over a billion organisms uh, in it. Uh, he found his soil was getting uh, sicker and sicker every year. Did research into this, discerned, uh, went and sunk his farm into several million dollars of debt in order to completely change the way they do agriculture um, uh, to a kind of agriculture that is not only um, organic um, and, and beyond sustainable, uh, but regenerative, where they're looking to uh, use the total resources of that land to continue to return them to the land. And the biggest measure of health uh, is not the dollars in the bottom line, as important as that is for any business, um, but uh, was he contributing to the health of the soil? And he got me thinking about that, uh, using that, uh, paying attention to the health of the soil as, as maybe a metaphor for something else. Um, by the way, uh, this uh, movie, The Biggest Little Farm, um, uh, a, a charming movie, and if you haven't seen it, um, I highly recommend it. It's about a couple who took a, a, a broken piece of ecology uh, in uh, 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 broken down soil, uh, 
bad uh, water situation like in California and created an absolutely gorgeous um, regenerated o oasis uh, on that land. Um, regenerate and not, uh, not restore. Restore is insufficient because restore assumes that in the soil, in a particular location, that that soil was once capable of growing what needs to be grown now. Maybe it was good for growing something else at one point. Maybe it was decent soil. Um, but you can't make the assumption that that's the soil you need to grow things in now because it begs the question, what are you trying to grow now? Well, I think culture is like soil. Um, it, uh, it is uh, uh, an ecology for growing cr some crops and keeping others out. Some cultures are great at promoting freedom, others are not. Some cultures promote obedience, others do not. Some cultures promote the value of experts and science-based facts. Others do not. Some cultures excel at oral communication. Others are much better with written. If we're getting weeds, tend to the soil. If we're getting small returns, tend to the soil. If we're dissatisfied with the quality of our political discourse, attend to the soil. If we don't like the candidates we're getting for office, attend to the soil. We need better soil for growing a democracy sufficient for the challenges um, than the soil that we once had. Uh, the soil of America has been seeded since its founding, seeded by and to favor white Protestants. From all of our history of our founding up until about 2010 uh, was the first time when this country became less than 50% Protestant and it's uh, sunk uh, further down even now. Uh, somewhere around 24 as I, uh, 2044 as I said, um, we're going to be um, uh, then also a no racial ethnic majority nation. Um, the soil that we have been, uh, our, our that in which our democracy has been growing things, or has been growing, um, uh, uh, is a soil that is not sufficient for what we need moving forward. We just can't restore what we had, maybe at one time, and get nostalgic about that. No, we need a different kind of soil, and, a, and, a, and a, in fact is a more powerful democracy than we had. Because in this country, there has always been a suspicion of democracy, um, um, that's built into the Constitution, and uh, we still hear and see now and then in, in matters such as uh, gerrymandering and uh, uh, voter suppression. Um, uh, racism has been with us from the beginning, um, and white supremacy is definitely still an issue we're dealing with, and these again go back uh, even into the Constitution. Um, religion. Uh, this country was meant especially for uh, white Protestantism, uh, evangelicalism, mainline uh, uh, Christians and Catholic Christians. Um, however, we are now the most uh, religiously diverse nation on the face of the earth. Um, Individualism, we excel at individualism in this country, and we excel at negative liberty. Liberty meaning that we, what we've pushed away from, uh, freedom from, uh, freedom from, you know, wearing masks, those kinds of things. Um, positive liberty, however, um, is freedom for. Uh, what are we free to do? Once we claim the freedom for, um, um, you have to deal with some things that the freedom from doesn't always remain attached to because the freedom from can become unmoored from responsibilities and from recognizing and protecting the freedom of others. Um, uh, freedom for has a much more difficult time in separating out what we're free for and our responsibilities and begging the question again of what others, um, uh, giving the same, uh, granting the same rights, recognizing the same rights in others. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, and uh, this is more and more a part 
uh, I think, of the historical record that historians are recognizing, um, the search for cheap land and cheap labor, and the historic exploitation of both, plus finance capitalism, are factors in the huge wealth and income disparities we are facing in the U.S. today. So, if we tend to the soil, we may conclude we're going to need the political equivalent of regenerative agriculture, and that's what I think. Um, so, this guy on the, on, on the right-hand side here, this is Paul Tillich. He was a theologian uh, from the middle and latter part uh, of the uh, 20th century, um, uh, was a very famous theologian, and gave us a couple of terms uh, that help out this study. First thought he gave is that whatever is your ultimate, that functions as your God. And the second thought is, religion is the substance of culture, and culture is the form of religion. See, what he's doing here, what he's going to help us with, is, is, is going to help us see how culture, religion, politics, they're not all fully separable. They may be separable for analytical purposes and to study each of them separately, but in actual life, religion, politics, and culture are all generators of meaning, and they're all braided together. Um, uh, his first claim there, but whatever his ultimate functions is your God. This means that uh, anything or anyone can serve the role of God for a person. It could be, you know, yourself. It could be a tree. It could be putting everything on a line for a particular political win. It could be the pursuit of money. It could be a bottle of scotch, whether it's a cheap one or a really good one. Um, it could be your spouse. It could be a nation. Anything functionally can serve as God. Raising the question, uh, then, in a culture, what is ultimate, of ultimate importance, ultimate meaning within that culture? His second thought is that uh, helps us understand that the separation of religion and politics and religion from culture more generally is really a modern practice. For culture is an umbrella category. Um, uh, religion and politics like art and literature are all elements of culture. All are aspects for how a society makes meaning. Religion and politics are in fact two strands of the same braid, uh, two strands of the same braid of culture. When I talk about the spirit of democracy then, as we move now from uh, uh, culture, religion, politics, all, all tied up together, and here then we come to the word spirit. Um, think uh, character, atmosphere, mental framework. Um, not only political parties, partisanship, voting, the mechanics of government alike. Have in mind a question like, what kind of people does democracy need, and what kind of people does democracy cultivate? Uh, the quote from Gandhi, democracy is some kind of inner quality. The quote from Churchill, oh, democracy is, is, a, is, is there's, there's an issue with it when it comes to human nature. Um, uh, Langston Hughes, in, in, in his poem Harlem, um, uh, democracy creates some kind of expectation for something. Um, uh, the fulfillment of which either comes or if it does not, may explode. All right, so there is an ultimate, everybody has an ultimate. What is that? That functionally is your God. Politics and religion are expressions of meaning making in a culture, now spirit and spiritual. Let's dig a bit into what I mean by spirituality. And we're going to uh, lesson, uh, I think it's the third week, we're going to talk, uh, I'm going to break out a lot more for spirituality as it relates to uh, religion, a particular kind, uh, democracy of a particular kind, and capitalism, um, which I'm not going to talk further about today. Every religion includes a spirituality, but not every spirituality is attached to a particular religious organization. So yes, you can be spiritual without being religious. Uh, it's also possible religious without being spiritual. 
Um, being spiritual means there's a practice involved. So let's, let's read, read this definition I'm going to offer for spirituality. Spirituality is the beliefs and practices that form heart-deep habits through which human beings connect to whatever they consider to be most important in life, the ultimate, and orient them toward everything and everyone else. The beliefs and practices that form heart-deep habits through which human beings connect to whatever they consider to be most uh, important in life and orient them toward everything and everyone else. Uh, summary words there, you see those in bold. Form, habits, connect, ultimate, orient. I need to acknowledge my debt to Parker Palmer and Robert Bella, who themselves would have to acknowledge their debt to Alexis de Tocqueville for the phrase, habits of the heart, from which uh, heart deep habits is derived. When we're talking religious habits, spirituality as far as religion goes, um, uh, we're talking about such things as you, you can imagine prayer, gathering together, public worship, observing a calendar of special days and, 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 and holy days, holidays, um, works of love, justice, and compassion. Um, those habits create connections to God and one another and orient ourselves to the rest of the world. Um, we could also uh, think of democratic habits, where maybe the people is the ultimate, depending on how your, your framework or your constitution is put together, um, with rituals that form habits like voting, um, gathering for community deliberation, uh, arguing. Uh, definitely you can't be in a democratic society without uh, being able to deal with argument and compromise. Um, holidays again, uh, saying the pledge. Um, acts of care for and about our neighbors, uh, participation in voluntary organizations. One of the hallmarks of this democracy is that we do not expect our government to do everything for us, so we form voluntary organizations to do a lot of things ourselves. Um, um, a democracy also may or may not make room for a loyalty beyond itself, right? Um, uh, uh, a loyalty beyond itself to acknowledge there may be a God, uh, who have, to whom uh, we have, or some of us at least, believe we have obligations that can't be fulfilled within democratic society, or we believe in an international organization of some sort, which in fact uh, is more important overall in the big scheme of things than a particular nation, or we might think of something such as, oh, the survival of humankind. Uh, may in fact be um, a cause, an, an ultimate which is beyond our nation. Um, uh, fascism would also have a, a set of habits uh, that result from a sort of, a, it's, it might sound like a really funny phrase, fascist spirituality, um, but in fascism, uh, the state's the ultimate. There's no loyalty that could surpass the worship due to the state. Um, there is a worship of control, uh, there is the use of violence and threat of violence to keep people in line. Um, there is surveillance of all sorts. There are mass gatherings one turns out to to show one's obedience. Um, and you show your loyalty to the state by surveilling your neighbors, your family, your children, your parents. Well, here may be a clue to both what is missing in our culture soil currently and a way forward. Pay attention to the soil, where we're growing things, what are we growing there, what's not growing, what are the weeds and the like, and pay attention to our habits, because there we'll see what kind of spirituality we are actually living. Alright, this is a pretty dense slide, so let me take a little time with it. Um, uh, one way to think about spirituality and democracy is through the questions that spirituality addresses. Uh, spirituality addresses questions like who we are, um, uh, what is the source of power and how do you connect to that power, um, uh, how do we measure uh, the importance of various relationships, um, uh, and then meaning uh, is, is key, of course, to spirituality, especially meaning around suffering, meaning around transcendence, meaning, meaning around... Uh, you know, how do I know that my life matters? Those are all spiritual questions. But note 
that while these questions are derived from the study of religion and culture, they can be answered with democracy in mind. To be specific, I'm going to try answering these questions, or at least suggesting answers to them, with the present day in mind. For purpose and power, do note our Constitution starts with we the people. Not God, not a monarch, not a ruling elite. And the we the people is often combined with the uh, particular words from the Declaration of Independence about being created equal, about having rights, amongst them the pursuit of happiness, and then with the preamble to the Constitution, uh, those virtues and values that uh, together add up to a more perfect union. Um, relationships, Constitution, yes, uh, there we talk about relationships in the Constitution, but the Constitution is at best a skeleton for the Republic we're to put together. The way we live with each other, the spirituality, the religion, so to speak, that we practice with one another is how we express spirit and soul. Uh, you'll note there's nothing about family or local communities in the Constitution. There's the federal government, there's the state government, there are individuals. That's all. There's room made for us, we the people, to make a lot of those decisions on our own. Meaning? Meaning comes out in, in democratic societies is most evident in particular times. A presidential election years, uh, where the competing understandings and visions for what the country are, uh, country is and should be, are uh, really on display. Um, times of war and reflection on war deaths. Um, times where we are calling for some kind of shared sacrifice and whether or not people actually heed that call. That's quite uh, uh, an expression of what our spiritualities really are. In times of civil unrest, when the will of a group of people is at odds with the nation's direction or with the government's use of power, we see what is meaningful to us. Um, and that kind of tension today between Black Lives Matter and Blue Lives Matter and that sort of thing, uh, those, those movements, those phrases, those words, they are alternative meanings um, that aren't necessarily as, as opposed as, as maybe they, they, um, they are being acted out. Um, at least I hope there's a way forward with all of that. Um, but meaning expressions they are. Uh, and understandings of what the nation ought to be, they are. Um, we're going to explore these questions as applied to the spirit of democracy, the spirit of dominant religion, and the spirit of capitalism, again, as I said earlier in, uh, in session uh, number three. Um, here's an example of, of uh, coming from James Madison in Federalist 50 about the necessity of trying to fit a government to human nature, at least human nature uh, would be the American nature. Um, uh, if, if people were angels, no government would be necessary. Um, uh, the, and and the, look at what the, he says, in framing a government which should be administered uh, by, and I'm going to use his men language because that's what he meant at the time, I think, by men over men. Um, the great difficulty lies in this, you must first enable the government to control the governed and the next oblige it to um, control itself. That is a um, expression of meaning uh, that implies an understanding of human nature. Um, uh, this other uh, uh, slide here, um, this, uh, this um, uh, bit of a, a, it's sort of a speech, sort of a prayer that Rabbi, Rabbi Mark Gelman gave uh, sometime at a, uh, after uh, the 9-11 event. Um, in times of crisis, uh, it is also revealed uh, who we are and what our practices are. And uh, Gelman uh, draws on uh, an ancient symbol uh, that was also quite important to some of the indigenous people in this nation. Uh, uh, that image, uh, the contrast between uh, the, the relative ease with breaking a single stick or a single arrow but if you bundle 13 of them together um, and try to break that, it's much more difficult to break. Um, so you'll see what Gelman has to say here, um, that uh, uh, in our comings and goings from this time forth, let's remember 
the person next to you, the person in front of you, the person behind you, is not merely an obstacle to your free and unfettered life, negative freedom. <laughs> they are part of this bundle, the Freedom Four, that keeps you and each of us from breaking. So, um, uh, Mark Gelman, uh, beautiful uh, use there of one of our national symbols, uh, which we put on the Great Seal. All right, religion and politics are strands of the same braid. Um, first, I want to say uh, very, uh, on this slide, very importantly, um, religion and politics is not the same thing as church and state. The relation between religion and politics is not the same as the relationship between institutional religion and the government. In Article 6 of, six of the Constitution, it says that there shall be no religious test for office. Um, the First Amendment, uh, uh, which speaks to disestablishment and free exercise of religion, um, says basically there will be no state church. One may practice their religion freely, but I also have to note that there's a caveat to that. Um, all rights are, if there be reciprocal rights, means that my rights have to be limited by your rights. Um, that sometimes individual rights are limited by community rights. Um, Oh, that's more controversial in the law, but uh, um, I'd argue it. Um, and, you know, recent examples being mass wearing and the prohibition of religious gatherings of a particular size and density wasn't targeting religion per se. Uh, they were strictly about public health. Um, so, uh, and, and this First Amendment has been implicated uh, by the side who was saying, you can't tell us not to gather uh, for worship just as densely as we want to. Um, uh, but that all that's to say, religion and politics are two programs of orienting persons to their community and their world. Remember the definition of spirituality, the values and belief frameworks and practices through which human beings connect to whatever they consider to be most important in life and their consequent orientation toward everything and everyone else. The orienting spiritualities of religion and politics are expressed in the following ways through founding stories and myths, through belonging, through moral order, and through empowerment. Um, myths and stories. Myths is, is, does, does not mean untruths. Myths means um, the deepest stories we have about who we are, um, uh, what we ought to be, what our destiny is. Um, uh, decisions about uh, belonging has to do with decisions about who belongs and who does not. Uh, what's the criteria for belonging? Um, a moral order uh, that lines out um, what we owe to each other um, and an understanding of what it is that keeps people from being all that they might be and overcoming those impediments. What's the power that allows that? Religion and politics share that we both offer up to a culture founding stories and myths, understandings of belonging, moral orders and empowerment. Let me give you a couple examples. Christianity. Here's a story, kind of cobbled together from various places. No one group would be, uh, you know, this particular story. Um, that there was a reform movement in Judaism in the first century of the modern era, uh, the common era, uh, led by Jesus of Nazareth, gathered disciples around him, had a ministry of teaching and healing, proclaiming the kingdom of God as at hand, uh, was put to death by the Romans uh, for insurrection, uh, and yet his followers claim that three days after his, his dying, God raised him from the dead, uh, and he is still alive and still, uh, 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 still empowering the church, uh, that, that community which gathered in his name, uh, to uh, be all that they can be. Um, empowerment is, is, comes by saving grace that comes from hearing the word and believing Jesus is the Son of God. Um, a belonging, one belongs as church, uh, believe we belong to the body of Christ. Um, no one gets into God's realm except through Jesus. No salvation outside the church. Those are all belonging kinds of statements. Um, the moral order um, may be simply to love as Jesus loves. 
Um, it may be more as Paul tried to line it out. Um, uh, it may be, um, you know, love the brothers and sisters, but not necessarily those on the outside. And it may be something like love what God loves and who God loves and hate what God hates and who God hates. Um, empowerment comes through believing and walking in Jesus' way, being faithful and trusting in difficult times. That's a story. A story. America's orienting spirituality. Well, here's one version of it. That there were Christian uh, religious refugees from various countries in Europe, along with men seeking relief from debt or release from the British class system or cheap land or seeking their fortunes, they established the world's first nation when they revolted from their British roots and established a constitution-based republic with a small measure of democracy at the outset. Their numbers multiplied and they spread west, acquiring land through war, treaty, theft, purchase. The white settlers believed God had given them the, con the continent to conquer and cultivate and Christianize. Um, the moral order was a combination of white Protestant mores and a devotion to individual liberty, all uh, uh, in the basket of white people are supreme. Conflict over the rightness and status of enslaved Africans led to a great civil war. Slavery was abolished after the war, but inequalities persisted. A subset of white males ran the country originally, but much of the nation's history is represented, too, by an expansion of, and at times opposition to, not at times, expansion of, and at the same time opposition to, expansion of the voting franchise to all white men, to black males, to women, to indigenous persons. Another aspect of the history of belonging is told through suspicions of and restrictions on immigration. At various times, Germans, Irish, Jews, Catholics, Italians, Turks, Greeks, Chinese, Japanese, have all been either banned or were admitted in very restricted numbers. In recent decades, uh, our uh, immigration attention has turned to Central and South American uh, uh, persons and uh, Muslims. Through this all, there's been the narrative of the American dream that one can come from nothing and with nothing and through hard work and sacrifice, make a comfortable living and better their family and community. For many immigrants, this has been a promised land. But now please think about the American story and, and the attendant spirituality. Uh, if we change perspective from this predominantly white narrative, for there are multiple founding myths, multiple claims regarding who belongs, what we owe to each other, and what and who the problems are that need to be fixed. What does the American story look like for indigenous persons who were once 100% of the nations of the continent's inhabitants and today is about 1%. What does the American story look like from the perspectives of Spanish descended and mestizos persons in the Southwest or California or Florida who were here before the British? Or the Chinese who built the railroads alongside the Irish? What does the American story look like in chains from this hold of a slave ship or the lives of black Africans on Southern and Caribbean plantations? or under black codes or Jim Crow, down through the huge differences in matters of policing and economic well-being today. In the story as told by white authors, America was a promised land, the predominant image of African Christians adapted from Christianity is that the nation was Egypt. And they've been looking for an exodus and a share of the promised land of freedom and equality. These are all examples of how religion and politics are braided in the U.S. So I want to return, as we're getting close to the end now, to the analogy of soil as culture. If we're not getting the crops we want, then either we are not planting and tending them, or we're not forming the right habits, or the quality of the soil will not support these crops. Are we attempting to grow the pursuit of happiness, a more perfect union, justice, domestic tranquility, common defense, 
general welfare and the blessings of liberty for ourselves and our posterity? What are we dealing with today? We're dealing with climate destabilization, health care disparities, civil unrest, huge wealth gaps, um, what constitutes a good job and a living wage, persistent poverty, white supremacy, bigotry, rapid social change, technology that is constantly running over the human, humanity in our lives, uh, public schooling, college affordability, polarization at every level of government, polarization in houses of worship and between houses of worship, our inability to compromise, an underfunctioning House and Senate and consequently overfunctioning courts and executive branches, and young people who are quite disenchanted with democracy itself. So folks, this is an era of reckoning for our nation and for each of our sources of making meaning. For there are conflicting narratives, conflicting understandings of what it means to belong and who belongs, conflicting moral orders, and conflicting understandings of what empowerment means and what are the limitations that need to be overcome. This is not only a reckoning and a time of judgment and being held to account, it's also a, for the nation, it's also a reckoning for how faith groups, in particular Christianity, um, for how we have contributed to making meaning in this nation, the ways with, that we have used and misused our faith. I want you to think of each picture that I put in the slide um, uh, in terms of our conflicts and the spiritual questions uh, that that picture evokes. Children at the southern border, behind fences, belonging in moral order, a multi-religious nation, our story, the Proud Boys, belonging in moral order, narrative, Native American-led pipeline protests, certainly story and moral order. Black Lives Matter, narrative and moral order for sure. World War II vet who fought for a particular story, moral order, empowerment, and understanding of who belongs. In 1630, John Winthrop uh, gave a what has become a famous sermon in American history on the Arabella, before reaching the shore of what would become the Massachusetts colony. He spoke as if he were in the position of Moses, with eyes in the promised land that he himself would not enter, even though, of course, he did. He talked about that city set on a hill for everyone to see and judge. Let's hear those words in context for just a moment. He said, For we all must consider that we shall be as a city upon a hill. The eyes of all people are upon us. So that if we shall deal falsely with our God in this work we have undertaken, and so cause him to withdraw his present help from us, we shall be made a story and a byword through the world. We shall open the mouths of enemies to speak evil of the ways of God and all professors for God's sake. We will shame the faces of many of God's worthy servants and cause their prayers to be turned into curses upon us till we be consumed out of the good land whither we are going. Folks, that is not, as it's often used, a, a, a sermon of blessing predominantly, about how blessed the country is. That was a sermon about, look, we're doing something important and special here, and the eyes of the entire world are upon us. That's the city set of hell. Everybody can see us. What did they see? What did they see when they look at us? Um, this is a time of reckoning we are in. Our class roadmap. So what are we going to get? What are we going to do? Um, next week I'm going to talk about uh, what is democracy and why is it in trouble. Uh, third session I've already spoken about. Fourth session, evidences of a healthy democracy. I think that's important to ask, well, what would a healthy democracy look like? And then, of course, and how can we, uh, who are people of faith and spirituality and moral depth, uh, what can we do to help regenerate, not restore, regenerate the spirit of democracy in the U.S. And I've got some helpers along the way. Um, I've had four, uh, uh, four people whose work I admire greatly who have uh, um, 
three of the four have recorded so far. The fourth, uh, uh, Kelly Brown Douglas, really hoping she, she, um, uh, she and I uh, keep our appointment at the end of October. Uh, but the four persons are Robert P. Jones, uh, Diana Butler Bass, Kelly Brown Douglas, and Jack Jenkins. Um, you'll hear more about them as we as we go along, and uh, as I introduce them in the in the, uh, uh, in the lecture. Uh, um, in the, I'm sorry, introduce them in the um, in their videos and in their interview videos. So that's this week. Um, uh, you'll be getting a link from me uh, to the uh, to Zoom where we'll, where we'll conduct our conversation on Thursday, and in between uh, seeing this. And, and then Thursday, if you have any questions to ask um, uh, uh, or thoughts on any of this, please send it to me. I will do my darndest to respond to each of you personally. Um, and if you, don't, if you want me to use a question but not, for instance, put your name with it, um, use a question in a public response and not put your name with it, happy to do that also. Thank you very much for tuning in. And that is it for today. And it's going to take me just a second here to be able to... Um, uh, close off this video recording.